Welcome to the Flyman Fishing Show, where we talk fly fishing, fly tying, and everything in between. I'm your host, Scotty Davis. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Today, we have uh, John Mauser with us, who is a fly fishing guide in North Carolina and is also the owner and designer of Mauser Fly Rods. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you Good. so much for having me on today. Absolutely, man. Pleasure to talk to you. So uh, how's the fishing? How was the winter fishing for you? Uh, fishing has been great. I, that's probably one of the best things for me about 10 years ago is when I discovered I could fish here in coastal North Carolina 12 months of the year and have something to chase. Yeah. Thank goodness for redfish. We can chase them 12 months a year. So uh, we had a really good winter season uh, for reds. We're kind of in that transition period now where things are starting to switch up and other things are starting to show up uh, near shore, you know, Bonita, Albacore, all that cool stuff. But the last three months have been fantastic for winter redfish. Um, we had a couple weeks where I think it rained like 20 inches in a week, which kind of messes it up for that clear water fishery. But other than that, we had lots of fish and you know how that, that cold water redfish goes. If you can find those groups and if you can keep quiet enough about them and, and keep everybody else from finding them, you can have some unbelievable fishing in the wintertime, which we had this year. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is kind of to totally different people that come here and have only fished high tide for redfish. It is a drastic change, mm -hmm. uh, mainly due to that water clarity that we don't have the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, so where are you guiding Europe on the Emerald Coast? Yeah, it's a, they call the area Crystal Coast. So basically, I'm in Swansboro, North Carolina, which is about 45 minutes south of like uh, Moorhead City, Cape Lookout area, and I'm about an hour north of Wilmington. So we mostly fish redfish anywhere from, you know, Beaufort, North Carolina, Moorhead City, uh, on through Swansboro, Emerald Isle, that whole area. And then we do, you know, in the fall and spring, we do other things near shore from Cape Lookout on down to like New River Inlet topsail area. Nice. Um, so you, you bought a new boat this year, right? For the, new to Aldi's, me. the bigger stuff? Yeah, new to me. So I've been, uh, I've been guiding for since 2012. Uh, I've lived in Swansboro about 15, 16 years now. And uh, yeah, I've gone through, like most people, I've gone through probably half a dozen boats in the last 20 years trying to figure out what was perfect for me. And I've been fishing a polling skiff or a couple different polling skiffs for the last 10 years. And I just decided this year we had a couple uh, pucker and prey moments coming in the inlet <laughs> uh, where we were surfing and you're just, you tell the clients to hold on. And, and after last fall, as much fun as I had at albacore fishing, I said, we're not doing this in an 18 foot polling skiff anymore. Uh, some days you're fantastic and some days you probably shouldn't be out there. So uh, just as we expand the business, I bought a 23 Parker from a good friend of mine who I've known for years. And I, um, I really trusted this guy that he had taken really good care of the boat. He'd repowered the motor. So we're good to go. Now I've got two options as far as, you know, if we want to fish bigger groups along the beaches for Albies or Kings or Amberjack or whatever, or Cobia, we can do that. Or we can jump on the little boat and fish redfish. Nice. And you're running an East Cape Fury, right? Yes. Fury. Uh, I've had that boat for, since 2014 so coming on seven years thank you uh, kevin at east cape would probably not want to hear this maybe he <laughs> would i think that's going to be my forever boat yeah so i don't know how many more i'll be buying from them but i'm probably going to run an east cape for for a long time uh i'll probably have to have it repowered and have it re-gel coated every few years because uh, if you look underneath it looks like freddy krueger went to town underneath of it from the oysters but that's how mine know, was it, yeah i i can't i always uh Every time I had a boat within a year, I was kind of mentally window shopping for that next boat. And I know a lot of people that do that. That Fury has just been such a great all around platform for me and for the anglers. I just, I don't have the need to look for anything else. I'm so happy with that boat. Yeah. And Kevin and Mark are awesome people and they'll totally take care of you forever. Yeah. It, they're family. Yeah, for sure. That's what I had. I ran a Lostman for a while. Um, and it's not a perfect do everything boat, but for getting in the grass, it just, it was almost unbeatable. Yeah. And it was a huge trade off because that's really what I like to do. So, and, and I just loved it. Uh, but same thing, I had to get it repowered and I would take it down there. They would do all, they would do all the work for me. Um, yeah. I had, I ran it hard. <laughs> just yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. 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 And it's then, a tool. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, and I was the same way. I'm never getting rid of that boat, never going to get rid of it. And then one of my clients just offered me a, more much more than it was worth so i, I yeah. jumped out of it but i'm going to get another one i think that's awesome but i like that fury because you it's got the more of the vantage style spray rails in it and it handles the rough water it was, it was one of those deals where I, I was in a little bit smaller pulling skiff that would handle when i started guiding it would take one other client real well 
but I got iffy if I had to take two clients and there was no way I could do three and I needed a little bit bigger platform. But I saw, and you know this, a lot of the places we fish may not necessarily, the fish might not be in six inches of water, but there's going to be a part of that creek where because of the oysters or the sandbars, just getting to those fish, you've got to get through four, five, six inches of water. Yeah. So I needed something that could get there. But at the same time, I wanted to be able to take it out the inlets. And I looked at the lost men, they float a little shallower, but that fury, I felt like on the good days, we could go run down the beach. And I've had that boat 10 miles offshore a few days, you know, in two to three footers, which is not what it's designed for, but it, it's handled it. And we've right. gone and smacked some fish with it. So nice. it's a great boat. Yeah, it's the same boat. When the fury came out, Kevin was like, yeah, you know, just bring it down. We'll put in the new hole bottom for you and just keep your top deck. And I, yeah. just could, I couldn't sacrifice, but the layout on those things is so great. Yeah. Well, nice. Um, so are you the spring? So are you, you're currently red fishing the, the Bonita stuff will slow down. Well, no, it's or, just starting up is here. It? So, you know, everything, everything that, you know, you see it, these fish in Florida and then South Carolina, and then we know we're going to get them next and they're going to move on. Um, so redfish right now, they're still schooled up. Usually what we get is uh, December through end of March, sometimes early April, depending on the temperatures. Um, the water will stay clear, but once all that bait starts to come back in, we start to see the mullet. Once the um, the water starts to get that green tinge to it and the pollen's all over like right now and the temperatures are up now. So now we've got water temps inshore in the low 60s, those fish will start to break up. Still good fishing, but we don't have the schools. Right around the same time is when we get the, generally first thing we see are the albacore that come mm -hmm. up along the beach. So and they're offshore in North Carolina all year. So if you went 15 miles out in February, you'd have seen albies. But right now with the bait coming in shore, we're seeing albies right outside the inlet. Um, within the next couple of days, we'll start to see really good push, pushes of bonito. Um, it's all temperature related. And then as the bonito are getting really good, the albies kind of fade out and they move north. And then right as the bonita start to fade out the end of April, beginning of May, uh, Spanish mackerel show up. So it's just kind of, they're all kind of just overlapping each other by a little bit. And on a good day in April, you can go catch all three of those species, maybe throw in some big bluefish too. Yeah. And the cobia will run up there as well, right? Yeah. So we, we either, it's either feast or famine for us with cobia. And I get people that call me that say, Hey, you know, end of May, let's go fish for cobia. And it's so hard because we have some years where it's just, you go out Beaufort Inlet and it's nothing. You could walk across the Menhaden all the way to the Cape and there's cobia in there and there's sharks and you can see them working the bait balls and the next year i think the cobia just stay offshore they skip right from south carolina go right up to like cape hatteras and then up into the chesapeake bay and we only see a few so on the years that it's good i love the cobia fishing in may and june um and then some years we just don't see them that much so fingers crossed that they'll show up this year yeah you'll have a, you do a lot of the spring shad run too right yeah so we do um Depending on the river, uh, the shad can show up in, in February. They could show up in March. So um, in the Noose River, which is the closest river to me, the, the large river system, we'll get them uh, February through March. And then a little bit farther up the Roanoke, which is really well known for the shad and for the striped bass, um, those fish will show up sometime mid-March. And then those shad will stay through middle April. And as those shad start to kind of finish their spawning run and, and we see less of them as they're leaving, the striped bass show up you know, early, mid April. And then there, those fish are there all the way through middle of May, late May. Nice. So. And that's the, around the Weldon area. Yeah, that's Weldon. And that's, yeah. so I'll go up there May 1st through about May 14th and just stay up there for two weeks and, and fish those stripers. That's just the coolest thing. We, those, there's a lot of people that fish them in April, mm -hmm. but April on the Roanoke river is the keeper season. So you can go to the boat ramp and there by 8 AM, there'll literally be 200 boats or 200 trailers there and all those guys are fishing within two or three miles of the ramp. So uh, everybody's there because they can take a couple home. Starting May 1st, it's catch and release only. So that same stretch of river will have 15 boats. 12 of those guys will be fly fishing and it's all catch and release. Those fish are spawning. You can get them on top water early and late. Middle of the day, they're down 20 feet and you fish a, a sinking line with the clouser. Um, it's such a cool fishery. I love it. I started fishing that about 15 or 16 years ago. And, and the first time I did that, the shad and the stripers there, I said, I will do this every day, every, yeah. every year. I'll do this every spring for the rest of my life. You know, whether that's guiding or fun fishing until I can't do it anymore, because yeah. that is, you know, there's a lot of signs of spring, but when you're floating down that river and you can hear the turkeys calling and you can smell the honeysuckle and you can, 
and 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 have a striper come up and blow up on a popper. That's that's springtime for me. Heck yeah, man. Yeah. God, you're making my heart flutter here. It's fun, man. Yeah. I like Shad too. I'm a closet Shad fanatic. I love Shad. Yeah. Shad's the fish that makes everybody uh feel like a great fisherman because they yeah. all winter they they didn't catch that much and it's been cold and you get a day in March and you go out and catch 50, 100 fish, you know, and when I've started shad fishing up there, everybody threw six weights because they were throwing, you know, 200 grain sinking lines and mm. just rods have gotten better and lines have gotten better. And now we'll fish three and four weights up there with like 125, 150 grain line. And you catch a two or three pound shad, like it's not a huge fish, but yeah. he's it's like a tarpon. He's flipping three, four feet out of the air. And he's, yeah. they're so much fun, dude. And you can just wail on them. Yeah, to totally. Perfect for kids too. I got two small kids and they can oh. just, they have, they have to drag him out of there, you know? Yeah. I love it. Cause even, even for a kid or somebody, it's, it's a perfect fish for somebody who's just starting fly fishing too, because a lot of those rivers, you know, those shad are sitting in the current. So if you can get in the right spot where there's a seam in the current behind mm -hmm. a rock or a tree and those fish gather up, they can literally just roll cast five feet of line out and just shake that line behind the rod tip and strip. And if that fish misses it, you just shake three feet of line out right yeah. back behind that stool to strip through again. And it's, I had people who have never touched a fly rod until the day they went shad fishing and have fell in love with it. Cause there's such an easy fish to catch. Yeah. It's a super confidence builder mm -hmm, for sure. What, uh, is there a particular color you like to fish for the shad? So, well, when I started and, and I know different areas are, are different colors, but when we started pink and white was the hot fly. And the main thing was, make them easy because you had to tie a ton of them because there's so many hangs up there. You, you might go through a couple dozen flies on a trip. Yeah. So we would just do like a white marabou tail. This is like a number, you know, number four, number six hook and a little bit of pink estaz for the body. The other fly that's gotten real popular in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years is just a little plume of uh, yellow marabou and then a little plume of red marabou. And it looks it looks like a little miniature palola worm tarpon fly <laughs> type thing. Yeah. And I don't know what, if the shad think it's a baby eel or if they don't care, if they just see it well, but they, they love those little red and yellow marabou flies. And I'll just tie a hundred of them because they're so, you know, it's not a big deal to lose them on the stumps because they're so easy to tie. Yeah. So do you have you just got to get their attention. You fish two flies, tandem flies too. No, I just, generally I just fished one. Um, I've fished two flies before and on a spinning rod, we've done like a, you know, a, a spoon and a, and a grub or something like that. But generally we just do one fly. Um, it's, it seems to be easier for the clients and it's so consistent that, you know, even if they catch one at a time, like they're, they're catching them every other cast. Yeah. It's weird where we fish the upper part of the Cooper river where the, they call it the tail race canal is our big, uh, shad fishery. They won't hit a single fly. You can fish all day and you'll never, ever get hit. And the second you tie on that second fly, you like clockwork. But it's oh, got to be chartreuse. Oh, it's really? That reaction thing. I've tried every every yeah. combination, you know, that pinks and whites and everything that's supposed to work elsewhere and nothing works. Yeah. Are those hickory shad or are those big they're American both. shad? But they're okay. Americans, yeah. We got yeah. some hickories, but, you know, I don't really – I wouldn't go up there for that. Yeah. It's weird. So each each of our river systems in North Carolina, you know, when I think about that, I think about the, the Tar, the Roanoke River, the Noose River, and the Cape Fear River – each one has a different amount. So some of those rivers like the Cape Fear, it's almost all big American shad and a few hickory shad. If you go to the Noose River, it's 98% hickories and then just a few Americans. So every single river has a different amount or different percentage of the shad, but you can catch either one in any river system. Yeah. I don't know why. Hmm. And the stripers are eating those uh, hickory shads, right? They're eating the hickory shad and they're eating um, the river herring, the little blueback herring, and, yeah. and you'll you'll catch those in there. They, uh, gosh, it's probably been at least ten years. They put a moratorium in North Carolina on river herring uh, because of, they were just depleted so bad. But they've made a comeback, and and the stripers rely on eating those a lot when they're up there too. Nice. Were they gill netting them, com like commercially fishing them? Um, gill netting and pound netting them. Right. Um, and it was that. It was water quality issues. It was just general overfishing of them. Um, we could get into an entire podcast <laughs> on, uh, on, on fisheries management yeah. and mismanagement. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's sad when, when any type of fishery, and I've seen this with striped bass, with river herring, with flounder in North Carolina, anytime that these fish are allowed to dwindle for a certain amount of years, whether that's five years, 10, 20 years to the point where we have to close down a complete fishery, 
something's not being done right with the management of those fish. We could have tightened our belts a little bit each of those years to not get to that point. And I understand like in North Carolina, we get, you know, in February, you might get a, a, a trout kill, you know, a speckled trout kill, or you might get, um, you know, down in Florida, they might get a freeze and the snook die off and they have to close the season down. Those are like natural things. And that kind of comes out of nowhere. But when it's something just on the amount of fish that are kept, and, and we just keep too many of them for too long a period to the point where we go, wow, these fish can't rebound unless we completely close the fishery for 10 years. You know, something's not being done right. Right. Like you said it right earlier, mismanagement. Correct. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's tough because you walk that line of trying to protect, you know, your fisheries and your livelihood and you want your kids to catch these fish, but also like, you know, <laughs> loose lips sink skiffs type thing too so like you, you know you get too vocal about it I've, there's enough people around here guides and, and recreational fishermen who have gotten you know threatened so it's not it's one of those things where we all we all we all need to work together to to try to change this fishery for the betterment of everyone because you know whether you're a recreational fisherman a commercial fisherman a guide doesn't matter if we lose this fish, these fish, we all lose these fish and we all lose the ability to catch these fish. So we should all be in that together to try to figure this out so that we can keep these fish around for, for a long time. Yeah. Well said. Um, so you're after the spring, when does your tailing redfish season really kick off? I know they're starting a little bit now, but when yeah, is it really? So, yeah. I'm always jealous of our buddies down in South Carolina. <laughs> their stuff starts a little earlier and their stuff lasts a little bit longer. Um, so I've seen tailing redfish in North Carolina. And, and so let's rewind back. There's a lot of different types of tailing redfish. So, you know, you go down to Tampa and you talk about tailing redfish or you go to Louisiana or, you know, Mosquito Lagoon or anywhere like that. They have tailing redfish, but it's, it's different. Basically from a little north of me in uh, like Moorhead City, Beaufort, North Carolina, on down through, you know, Northern Florida on the East Coast, maybe St. Augustine, Jacksonville, We've got tailing redfish in the Spartina grass. So our tailing redfish in the Spartina grass start up. We see a few in April, May, it really starts kicking in. Um, if I wanted to tell a client to come up here on a really good month, I would say June, July, August, and September is when it's really good. May is definitely worth it. April's a little early. And then October, it, again, it just depends on how quick it cools because those fish are up there because of the opportunities. But, you know, if it's, late September, early October, and there's still crabs on the flats, but there are millions of um, mullet just outside the flat in the intercoastal waterway, and they're yeah. just begging to be eaten. Those redfish sometimes, even though there's food on the flats, they're going to take whatever's uh, probably, I guess, the, the, the most energy they can gain for the least amount of work, and they'll probably go after a big school of mullet sitting there on the edge of a flat versus little fiddler crabs. Yeah. So, so it's starting um, off. It's, it's weird how the flats are so much better up around you as they are like behind Topsail Island and stuff. It just doesn't seem to be like where you live. It looks like Charleston. It looks like the low country. You have beautiful, expansive grass flats. Yeah. But what little I fished around like Topsail in that area, it, they were harder to find and they, they just, it wasn't the same. Yeah, it, it seems like there's from, from like Beaufort, Moorhead City, down through Swansboro, maybe down to New River Inlet. So almost a Topsail. We've got really good Spartana grass flats. And then it seems to pick up again once you get down towards Wilmington, you know, Bald Head Island, Oak Island. That way they've got a lot of good flats. I, I don't know what the difference is on, you know, why the topography changes as you go, you know, down the coast. Um, but I think one of the things about our flats is, you know, we do have some of these giant expansive flats that'll take you 45 minutes to pull across. And then we've also got flats that you can literally – you know, you could stand on one end of it and see a redfish tail 200 yards on the other side of it. They're little small pocket flats, but they can also still be really productive if the, the scenario is right for those fish to get on and off the flats and if the food's there. So, you know, I'm not just looking for big ones where we've got little nooks and crannies all over that we can find these fish too. That's what I call them too, those pocket flats. I like those a lot. <laughs> yeah. Little jewels. Um, yeah. So is there a certain height? Generally in Charleston, it's around six. People think it's around six feet. You know, is there about the same there? You need a No, we, our tides are a lot less. So um, even like, you know, our tide is much different than an hour north or south of us. You know, we've all got different inlets and different amounts of flows and the coast kind of comes in and out. So all that affects it. But 
our average tide uh, in the Swansboro area is about a 2.5 foot tide. Wow. So, you know, 0.0 is about low tide, 2.5 is about high. Sometimes we'll get, you know, a couple, you know, a, a negative tide of like, I don't know, half a foot negative tide. But our flood tides, I start looking for redfish at 2.7 foot. The biggest tides we get right here are 3.1 foot. So I'm looking kind of a like a 2.7 or like a 3.1. If you drove 45 minutes north of here on that same day, it's exactly 12 inches higher. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's known whatever area, you can't like know what the tides are in, you know, Wilmington and come up here and look at a tide chart. It's, you know, you've got to know for each area what it's going to be. And, it, you know, it's weird. I think, I think the, the marsh kind of forms around uh, what the tides do over, overall, you know, thousands of years. So, um, down in Charleston, you know, those big tides, the, the Spartana grass has got a, you know, the, the water or the marshes eroded away at a certain height and the Spartana grass grows at a certain height. And we have a lot less, uh, water flow as far as tide change here. So our Spartana grows lower, you know, it's towards, it, it's all got to do with the height of the tide. So it's weird that there can be, you know, you might go to Georgia and see an eight foot tide and you might go to Swansboro and see a two foot tide but they'll still hold tailing redfish as long as that grass floods. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. I didn't realize they were that, that low of tides. Like, like yeah. you said, we're six foot here. If you go to Savannah, if we have a six foot, it's nine foot in Savannah. Yeah. And I just couldn't imagine having to get off the flat that fast, you know, oh shit, man, I'm about to lose nine feet of water, you know? Well, yeah. Like, and it's weird. I, I, I fished uh, on foot. I fished Charleston, a couple of the flats you can walk in. Mm. It, it blew my mind because I could literally, stand there as i'm casting and almost watch the tide rise I totally. and that's the thing too is that you know you can get too high of a tide if that if that water gets too high those fish are on those grass flats and they may be standing up tailing but you don't see them so you're right. constantly having to seek that you know that i don't know six inch to a foot and a half range where you can actually see those fish yeah what are your favorite flies to throw in the grass so i don't you know i don't really have many flies that have a commercial name you know, so <laughs> right. it, you know I mean? like like quans or clousers and things like that we kind of we just whip up some stuff that looks buggy and generally what i tell people around here is if it looks buggy and it can easily look like a shrimp or a crab depending on the way things sits in the water and the way you strip it um, if it's got any combination of claws legs eye stalks weighted towards the eye of that hook so it sits up in a fighting position if it's got a couple of those things usually it will trigger that instinct for the redfish so i almost feel like around here instead of trying to be really specific trying to be a fiddler crab and maybe he's got a blue crab on his mind or he's got a shrimp on his mind just do something that overall elicits that reaction in that redfish that he looks at it the thing's sitting there it's got eyes sticking up it's got legs and it's in that position so it hops backwards Usually, you know, that's about all it takes. Um, I like materials that flow a lot um, without having to move it a lot. So a lot of zonker and craft fur and things like that. But some of these flies are super, super basic flies with just a few saddle hackles, um, a few, uh, you know, a few different like Estaz materials and palmering materials. Mm -hmm. um, we do fish heavier eyes because the whole idea with tailing redfish is that, you know, you got to get that down to their face. So you know, sparse flies, heavier eyes that don't catch the top of the grass that you can wiggle it and it drops down pretty quickly in front of their face. Heavy weed guards. Heavy weed guards for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Nice. nice. Um, so tell me a little bit about Mauser fly rods. How did, how did this all come yeah. to fruition? Oh gosh, how long do we have? So it's a... Uh, <laughs> we got a bit. Yeah. Um, the fly rod company was, it was two things. It was kind of a, uh, just a continuation of, of my love of, the water fly fishing, fishing and everything involved with it. And just trying to figure out how I could continue to um, be a part of this, not this industry, but this sport. And, um, and then also part of it was just honestly trying to find fulfillment and meaning in life. And uh, I spent um, 15 years as a Marine biologist and it, you know, it started off as my dream job. It was something I wanted to do since I was a little kid and, and it was for, you know, five or 10 years, but honestly, I hit a ceiling with that. Um, and that's got to do with pay. And it's also got to do with opportunity for growth. And I'm one of those people that is, it's just like fishing. Like if you're not constantly learning something new and challenging yourself, like what's the point? Right. Um, and I got to that point and 
you know, I'd started the guide service back in 2012. And that was just going to be like a weekend uh, niche type extra cash thing to help put the kids through daycare. Yeah. Um, and that grew from there. Um, but in 2016, I was just, besides the guiding, I was just not really happy with my full-time job. And I was trying to find something I could do without uprooting my family and moving them out of state. Um, and I said, you know what, I've, I've, I've known enough people in the industry. I've, I've been on some pro staffs. I kind of know the in and outs. I think we can do this. And I just started doing the research on, you know, what can I do to build a brand in the fly fishing industry where we can, you know, not just making a living off of it, but how can we help people become better anglers? How can we bring more people to sport? Um, I was involved with Project Healing Waters for years. So it's like, how can we do things to help, you know, raise money and help grow these charity organizations? Um, and I said, you know, what the heck, let's, let's start a fly rod company. And let, like, let, what is the hardest thing you can do in your life that's going to challenge you every day and possibly drive you crazy, but also like keep you excited. You know, it's just going to be nonstop challenges. It's some stuff you've done before and some stuff you've never done before as far as a business. Let's do this and let's, let's build something that's not just something to try to make a quick buck, but something that we can build a legacy brand if we work hard enough at it and something that we can use as a vehicle to help other things. You know, we've got so many ideas as far as, you know, how we can use this to, again, introduce people to the sport, grow the sport, um, help things like Project Healing Waters. And, you know, there's, I mean, there's so many organizations out there that help replant, you know, mangrove forests or help with bonefish or help with the reefs and all this stuff, yeah. even like the Coastal Federation of North Carolina. Like, how can we become just, not just a, uh, you know, a company, but a brand that's, that's just part of the community. And, 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 you know, when I'm no longer on this earth, it's something that people can look back and go, man, they, they helped a lot of people out. So that's where the company came from. Um, awesome. yeah. What's your range of rods y'all are making? So we are, um, we're making American made rods. So they're on the higher end. Um, and I usually like to say that we're, we're basically trying to build rods that are competing with like the top five or six, American made companies as far as quality and performance. Um, so we currently, we've been out for four years where we just introduced our third range of rods. So the first ones we came out with are called the Waterman series and they are uh, five weight through 12 weight. Um, they're nine foot fast action, four piece rods. Um, those are about $700 rods and they're basically the best. We're working with another company in the United States who's rolling the graphite for us. They're, it's the best graphite, the best resin, the best, components, the best at this point, the best cork that we can source out, the best guides, all that stuff. Um, and then we came out the following year with a rod series called Arate, uh, a more, more trout focused series, uh, three weights through six weights, um, some shorter rods and anywhere from like seven and a half to nine foot, more of a medium action, um, still the highest in components. You could still take one of those rods and go fish it in salt water if you wanted to, but it's a little bit more traditionally styled towards a trout rod. And then this year, so at that point, we had like $650 to $700 rods, um, still decently affordable for American made rods. But we really, at all the shows, we talked to a lot of people who wanted, really liked what we were doing, but they just couldn't financially afford to make the jump from like $200 rods up to a $700 rod. Uh, so we worked with the company that's um, rolling the graphite for us. And they had some more, a little bit more affordable graphite and some more affordable ways uh, to build those blanks. Uh, so we came up with the osmosis series, which is again, it's a right now um, we have them in five, six, eight, and 10 weights. And then probably by the end of the year, beginning of next year, we'll add some seven and nine weights. It'll end up being, you know, five through 10 weight rods. Um, just trying to get the price down. Those are about $495. Nice. Still have all the same uh, components as far as guides is the higher end ones. Um, right. That's the hardest thing really is, is figuring out where you can cut the cost to make a more affordable rod, but not give up on the things you, you want that rod to have. You know, I, I from the get go, I, I always said I wanted to build rods that I was okay if people said, this is the best rod I've ever thrown and I'm in love with it. I just can't afford it versus people saying, eh, it's a pretty good rod for the price, you know? And so it's really hard to figure out where you're going to cut costs. Um, so we just basically made, you know, a more affordable blank, uh, but we're still using titanium guides. We're still using recoil snake guides and all that stuff. We're still using floor grade cork. 
um, really good real seats and all that stuff. So we were, we were able to cut here and there and get the price down a little bit. So those are our three series we currently have out. Um, right now is a still a very small company. We've got to build stuff that the majority of people are going to be interested in. So we have people asking, are you going to do 11 and a half foot nymph rod? Are you going to do one piece rods and all this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, but you have no idea how many you have to sell to make right. it work finding something like that. The cost of getting something started is really, yeah. you, you got to know that you're going to be able to sell a few of them. Yeah. So huge, we're not there yet. Huge cost. Yeah. So where can people find your rods? So uh, mauserflyfishing.com um, is where we're selling them right now. For the most part, we're just selling them direct. There's a couple other online um, stores that sell them also. Um, that was part of the deal where we, we had to decide when we came into this, could we kind of do it the old school way of going through the fly shops, selling it to them at a wholesale cost, and then having them market up, mark it up. And as a small company, it's just, we can't build a rod quite as cheap on our end as a bigger manufacturer can. So we thought the best way to do was going to, would be just to sell direct for now. And then we can call, cut the cost of the customers because everything we're doing really is for the customers, huge supporter of fly shops, but our business model, it was just best to sell them direct. So mauserflyfishing.com. Um, there's also in Western North Carolina, there's a rent this yeah. And so they stock a couple different high end models of rods and they've got a couple different, uh, models of watermans. So if you guys want to rent one from them, um, you can rent one from them and, you know, take it on a fishing trip and try it out before you buy one. Nice. Well, yeah, he's a it. super nice guy too. Oh, I love those guys. They're, they're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Thanks. Um, so you, you mentioned you've done some work with project healing waters. Didn't you, weren't yeah. you responsible partially for bringing the whole barbecue and everything back up there? Yeah. You know, yeah. So that years ago, it was so much yeah, fun. So, so 2000 and, um, 2013, we started a, a North Carolina or crystal coast, Project Healing Waters program it was me and two other people. And um, I think at this point, there's like 12 or 13 North Carolina Project Healing Waters programs. It's unbelievable how many there are across the US. Um, but then I partnered up with a couple other buddies of mine who were, um, we did this thing going back a little ways. There was uh, something called the Cape Lookout Albacore Festival for years. And that raised money, I think. Uh, Forgive me if I'm wrong, because I think it was for like Duke Children's Hospital. Yeah, I was think their, it was. was their charity. Yeah. And that thing got really big and people came from all over the United States to fish for albacore in the fall and be a part of that. And it, it kind of went away and it was it was gone for a few years. And then at the same time, we were doing a little thing every fall called Fat Tire Fest. And it was just a little group of buddies that would get together. It was 20 of us. We'd stay for a week and we had people come from Texas, people coming from New York, um, some rod manufacturers, just different companies that would come down we'd hang out and we had so much fun with that. Um, the guy who kind of headed that up said, let's, uh, let's try to turn this into a public event where we can raise money. So we got the blessings of the guy who did the original Cape Lookout Albacore Festival to use that name again. And so we fired that up about uh, six years ago now. And so it's a three day event that we do every, um, every October, right at the height of the Cape Lookout Albacore run. Um, it's, uh, it's usually the weekend before Halloween. I think this year it's the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. So it's a three-day event. It's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday event. The first, the Thursday event, we actually bring in disabled veterans uh, through Project Healing Waters. Uh, I think last time we had maybe close to 50 veterans that came down, most from North Carolina. But we had people that came from like Colorado and Montana and places that, you know, all they fished is, is trout. And we bring them down and we get enough guides and boats together um, and people volunteer their time and we take those guys albacore fishing. And we've had years where every single person's called albacore on fly. Um, they've seen the wild horses on Shackleford. They've seen the dolphins. Every single one of them's hooked up with 200 pound sharks behind trawlers. And these are guys who have never caught anything but a 12 inch rainbow. Right. Just completely blew their minds with it. And <laughs> we do it that whole day is dedicated to them. And we have a cookout that night. And then the, the next day, the Friday, we have a captain's party. It's open for the public. We do a bunch of fundraisers, a lot of companies donate and, uh, you know, companies, artists, uh, designers, they donate things for us to auction. Uh, we raise money at that captain's party. And then the following day, the last day is the tournament that's open to the public. And usually we get the last couple of years, we've got a hundred or so um, anglers who have fly fished that tournament. Um, we actually, the, the last year we expanded it to an inshore division also uh, for like redfish, uh, mm -hmm. trout and flounder just because there was a lot of people that wanted to get involved, but couldn't go out on the ocean side and chase albacore. 
That way we could bring in more people to help raise money. And all that money gets donated back to Project Healing Waters after that event. Uh, you know, after our cost, we don't keep any of it. It all goes back to them just to help fund programs for Project Healing Waters to, to get people tying flies, building rods, learning to cast and, and helping them heal. Man, you do lots of cool stuff. That's the tops right there. That's awesome. That's, isn't that the whole point of it? It man? is, like, totally. It's, I, I, I get more, you know, that whole program is for the veterans, but I get more out of it than, than the veterans do, Yeah. you know, and it's just, or not, maybe I don't get more out of it, but I feel like I get more out of it, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, because, you know, that gives me purpose. Like it, it doesn't matter what, you know, what your paycheck is or how many people remember you after you're gone. It's what matters is how many people you've touched and affected and kind of helped guide their lives after you're gone. So I want to, you know, that helps me go to sleep and at night and feel good about myself and wake up happy in the morning. if I'm, you know, if I'm helping people out. So, yeah, yeah that's great. And I've done a little bit with that program and it really does help those veterans out too. So absolutely. And, and you know, the thing, recovery, that's another good one too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All those things that, you know, people think about it as being something that helps those guys, you know, that one night a week when they're in that program, tying flies or that one fishing trip a weekend, a weekend a month that they're, they're fishing. But what it also does is it takes all these guys who've been through similar experiences that I've never experienced, puts them together in the same room. Now they have some other people that they can, you know, talk about some of these things they've been through that can relate with it. But it also brings them together and unifies them on this sport of fishing. So now all of a sudden they've got a reason to get out of the house and they've got a buddy or they've got a dozen buddies that go fishing. So these guys, you know, it's not just a program. We're kind of like a meeting place for them, but they branch off. And, you know, we hear all the time about, oh, me and so-and-so went fishing last weekend and we did this and that. And that's where it really goes is, is getting all those guys together and giving yeah. them a, a liked interest. Totally. And that's awesome. Um, so what's, what's next? What's your uh, plans for the rest of the day, the rest of the week? You fishing? Uh, you got charters lined up? Uh, no charters today. It's blowing out there today. I've got, yeah. um, I've got to talk to, uh, someone, have a business meeting about the rod company at 12 and, um, just kind of honeydew list after that. Uh, we fished, I fished Saturday. We went out and caught, we went looking for Bonita Saturday. Uh, they weren't quite here yet. Water temple's almost there. We got into a ton of albacore, all the albies you would want. Um, but then yesterday was Sunday and today's Monday and it's just been blowing the last two days. That's, that's been the toughest thing this spring is just, you know, managing the wind. Like yeah. there's a, a fisher there. It's just, can you get out there and find them? Yeah. That's what I always told people about here. Like when's the best time to come to Charleston? I'm like, well, it's really good year round, but March and April, just, you can't, you can't plan on anything because it blows so bad, yeah, but that's it, when the shad are here. So that's, that's yeah. what I'm going to do this week. Yeah, weekend. absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, you have kids too, right? Yeah, I've got a six and a twelve year old. Nice. You take them fishing with you? Yeah. Um, they a couple of years ago, like the twelve year old was more into it, but he's he's gotten into everything now. So, you know, whether it's stuff with electronics or he's in band at school and you know, it's sports, all this stuff. So he's he's at that age where he's got twenty different things pulling him in different directions. Yeah. <laughs> but he still enjoys getting out there, you know, and, and usually the the twelve year old will fish. Um, and you know, if it's fresh water, he'll fly fish for bluegill and bass. If he's caught redfish and albies and all that stuff on spin, he's not quite there yet for, for fly. And the six year old wants to come along. Six year old doesn't really care about catching fish, but he's got to have a rod in his hand, whether he's beating it against a tree or what he's doing with it. But you know, if he's got one, he's yeah. happy. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I want to, I, you know, the, I would love for them both be fanatical about fishing and fly fishing, but you know, whatever they're going to be into, I'm going to be into also. We've, we've looked a couple other routes and, you know, I, I'm big into wildlife photography and the 12 year old got into that last year. We, we had a lot of time with, uh, uh, with COVID to, to spin outdoors and, and go chasing bears and birds and all this stuff and taking pictures. So he got into that. And so, you know, whatever, whatever they want to do, I'm going to be a part of. Yeah. I think with a dad like you, the fly fishing is just, it's not if it's when it's just, it, yeah. it'll come, you know, it's one of those I things agree. you kind of have to be into. I don't understand people like, eh, I don't know. I don't think I would like it. Like, what the hell What's wrong with yeah. you? Yeah. You golf yeah. or something. Yeah. There's, there's, and even if it's not fishing, like we'll go out, you know, 12 year old and I, we'll, we'll go out and just walk the grass and look for tailing redfish, mm. you know, just take a picture of them or, or we'll go out and, uh, you know, go look for shark's teeth along the back of the barrier island. So, you know, I think the main thing is, and that I'm having to do is, especially here in 2021, is keep them outside when there's so many things that are drawing kids to stay inside, whether that's, 
you know, Nintendo Switch or iPad or, or whatever it is. It's just giving them enough stuff outside. When I was a kid, all we did was outside. We, you know, I, I sharpened sticks and threw them in the woods and <laughs> did the dark. And a lot of, I did a lot of stuff when I was 10 years old that I probably would freak out if I knew my kid was doing nowadays. But nowadays there's so much stuff that just draws them to the, to the electronics and the TV and the phone and the iPad. So it's just, as long as I can keep them outside and, and keep them loving nature, then that's fine with me. Yeah. You're doing a bang up job. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, talking to me today. No, Scotty, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, this, man. Is, uh, this is fun. It was really cool. Thank thanks, you. Dude. Come, uh, come visit. I would love to absolutely love to bring the fam. There's plenty to do for sure. We'll do that. Sweet. We'll definitely keep in touch. Cool. All thanks, right, man. Scott. Thanks, bud. Bye.